Hi everyone, welcome back to my Z80 computer series. So I'm continuing on with my endeavors with generating the video signals and the video circuitry. I've previously been looking at the pixel generation and I had some success with it, but there are still some problems. Got a bit, a bit of a way to go with that yet. So I'm taking a break from that and I'm turning my attention to the actual video RAM. So at the moment in my circuit, I have a ROM chip and that will only provide us with a static image to be able to change what's on the screen. We really need to have a RAM chip and some video RAM. Now, a big problem with um, the video RAM is we need to share the access. We need to share it between the CPU and the video circuitry because they can't both access the RAM at the same time. Only one thing can access it at any one point in time. So we need to figure out some kind of sharing mechanism. Now, this idea here that I'm showing you here is not my idea. I did say early on, I believe in episode one, that when I'd be designing this computer, I wasn't just gonna copy somebody else's design, but I did also say that I would be looking at other people's ideas and using some of those ideas. Um, but the final design will be my own, but there, there will be influences from other people's work. Now, this came from somebody on Reddit. They kindly um, shared their work that they'd done. They've, they've done this a few years ago, I think. Um, and the, the idea is coming from, from their circuit. So the idea here is when the CPU wants to perform a write to the video RAM, it would set up its own address bus with the address it wants to write to. And it would also set up its own data bus with the data that it wants to write. And then it would latch that address and data into these three registers here. So the top two here will hold the address and the third one down here will hold the data that's waiting to be written. From the CPU's perspective, this is very much like writing data to an output port. In fact, if you remember back a couple of videos ago, I think um, I was using the CPU to actually write to a register. I think I was using a 374 register. These are 574 registers. They are actually identical in functionality to the 374. They just have a, a nicer pin arrangement. And in fact, uh, memory writes and IO writes are actually very similar in how they work. So the CPU can just write to these registers without needing to be concerned with any timing of the video circuits. It just writes to the registers and continues on its own business. This in theory should have no impact on the performance of the CPU. There is no additional waiting times. Now on the other side of things, at a convenient point in the video circuitry timing, the video circuits can read from these registers. They can then set up their own address bus and data bus and perform the, the write to the RAM chip. The video circuitry also does not need to be concerned with any timing of the CPU. You can just read from the registers, perform its right, and then move on. So this kind of solves the problem of the, the two sides of things needing to coordinate with each other. They can just do their own thing in their own time, which hopefully should make my life a little bit easier as well. Now I might want to think about some mechanism of the video circuitry knowing if there is a write waiting to happen. I was thinking about maybe using a latch. Um, so the CPU write process into the registers could set that latch and then the, the video circuitry could um, be triggered by that latch to perform the write and then clear the latch. Um, so we're not, because the video circuitry is very fast, um, the CPU is probably gonna ask it to do a write and then the video circuitry is probably gonna go around this like thousands of times. We don't want to keep writing and writing, and writing the same data. Once we've written it once, we don't need to do it anymore. 
So it'd be nice to have a mechanism to know when it's done. But I haven't concerned myself with that right now. Um, I've deliberately tried to design this circuit here, so I'm not committing myself to any kind of logic. Um, all this circuit is really doing is connecting these registers to the, the RAM chip. Um, and then I'm breaking out all the control lines so I can just think about that later and do my own thing with it. Now, reading is a little bit different. Um, when the CPU wants to read from the video RAM, it will again set up its own address and latch those into the uh, address registers. And then it will try to read from its data bus. So this time the video circuitry will need to notice that there's a CPU read waiting and at a suitable point again in its own timing, it will need to read from these address registers and perform a, a memory read on its RAM chip. Um, that would put the data out onto its data bus, um, which would appear here on this um, bottom register. It would appear on both registers, but we're only concerning with this one. And then it has to latch that data into that register. So read from the address registers, perform the read on the RAM chip, and then latch the data into the read register. Now it has to do that pretty fast because the CPU isn't going to wait around. The CPU is just going to set up the address and try and do the read. Now I'll have to check the CPU timing diagrams here to know how much time we need because even with a normal memory write on the CPU, even if we were writing to normal memory, um, that wouldn't happen immediately. There would be some delay between the CPU asking for the data and the memory giving the data back. So we do have some time. I just need to check how much time we have. And one thing we've kind of got on our side with that is the video circuitry is running at a much faster clock speed than the CPU circuitry. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that the video circuitry will be fast enough to do that. So I'll just uh, sort of recap over the control lines. So if we think about the write process again, the CPU will set up its address bus and it will need to drive these lines here. It will need to pulse these lines here high to this one here and this one here. That will latch the data into these two registers. So that CPU VRAM clock would need to be pulsed high, to latch the data into here. Um, same thing would happen sort of on the data bus. CPU sets up the data and then it needs to pulse this line high, CPU right clock. That will latch the data into here. From the video circuitry side of things, again, I said I haven't sorted out how it's going to know that there's some data there waiting. But once it's figured out that there's some data there waiting, what it will need to do is drive these lines low, VCPU that will enable the output on these top two registers. These lines, this one here and this one here, they're both labeled up VCPU, so they are actually both the same line. So drive them low and then the data will appear here. That's the VRAM address bus, which is also connected to the memory chip. So as soon as it drives these lines low, the memory chip gets the address. Um, it then needs to drive this line low, VWR, that will make the, the data actually appear on the data bus here, the VRAM data bus, which is connected to the RAM chip. And then the only thing it needs to do is to drive this line low, VRAM, WR, and it will perform the write. Now with the, the read process, again, a little thing. Things are a little bit different there. So the address is the same. It CPU sets up the address and drives these two lines low, latching the data into here. Um, this time it just drives the CPU read line low and it's expecting the data to appear on these outputs, but they're, they're connected to the data bus. So it just expects them to appear on its own data bus as soon as it drops this line low. So in between, 
um, when it sets up the address and, and when it drives this line low. So in between that time period, the video circuitry needs to be pretty fast. It needs to again perform a read on these two registers. So it will need to drive these lines low again, these two to set up the address. It will then need to drive the BRAM read line low here to perform the read. Data will appear here and so then that will be followed up by the CPU driving the, the read line low to complete the process. So hopefully that explains um, the concept and how I've kind of decoupled the CPU timing from the video timing. Um, I think the way I'm envisaging the video timing will work. Um, I've got this process of shifting out the eight pixels at a time so I'm thinking that I set up that 138 chip on the video circuitry that we saw in a previous video that is connected basically to eight pixel clock cycles that repeat over and over. So there are going to be eight parts to the cycle as it shifts out the eight pixels. Now during those eight different clock cycles, I could do eight different things. Um, so the first thing I'll want to do is a memory read to read the pixel data. And then I want to do a memory read to read the color data. Then I want to combine those together, color and pixel data together. Um, and then I will have some spare time. And in that spare time, I will be able to use the other clock cycles to do things such as checking, do we need to do a CPU write um, or a CPU read? And I'm thinking that probably 50% of the time in the pixel clocking process, 50% of the time, I could probably just drive these vCPU lines low to say that during that period, the CPU has access to the RAM. And during the first four clock cycles, the video circuitry has access to the RAM. So I'm hoping I can figure out the timing there to share the access. So let's have a look at the PCB. So there's a two dimensional view of it. That's the top of the PCB. You'll see we've got the four um, registers here, 74HC574s. And over here, this vertical chip here is the RAM chip. Now I'm using the AS7C164A-15. Um, the video, the RAM we had in the trainer board was AS6 RAM. So I think this is sort of like a newer generation of RAM, AS7. Um, I imagine it's a quite old design now, but probably newer than the AS6 ones that we were previously using. And the 15 here is the typical access time of 15 nanoseconds. So this RAM is considerably faster than the ROM chip that we were previously using. The ROM chip actually had access times of 150 nanoseconds. So this RAM chip should be approximately 10 times faster than that ROM chip, which is again, it's in our advantage when we need so such tight time, when we have such tight timing constraints. And then really all it, the other things we've got on here are the, all the pins are broken out the top and the bottom here. So we've got the, um, the CPU address, we've got the CPU control signals, CPU data, and then we've got the video RAM address, the video RAM control lines, and the video RAM data lines. I have here got a power connector. I put two five volt connections on here and two ground connections. My thinking was I'd probably bring in power from the trainer board to one of the connections, and then I could piggyback power out to my breadboards with my additional circuitry on. Um, I've got a reservoir capacitor here. I was unsure about the size of that. I've gone with 47 microfarads. Might be a bit small. Maybe I should have gone with 100 microfarads, but I really didn't know how I calculate the size of that. The idea of the bulk capacitor here is that um, power is coming onto this board just via some flying leads. Um, and 
what the idea is that uh, um, this is sort of digital circuitry uh, operating uh, very fast. So it might, if it decides that it needs to drive you like a whole load of lines one at the same time, it might need to draw, relatively speaking, quite a lot of power. Um, and it can draw that power from this reservoir capacitor and get it get that power fairly quickly so it doesn't see a drop in the voltage on the on the supply rails i hope i've explained that okay feel free to call me out if if i'm not explaining anything correct um there are also uh bypass capacitors on each ic they're positioned as close as possible to the power pins so i believe this is the power pin here this is uh, positioned very close the same here here and here and then on this one i believe this is the power pin so it's connected here on the it's on the underside of the board um and uh, the idea of these is again the same kind of principle that if the individual chip needs to draw a bit more power it can actually draw it um, very quickly from these capacitors because these are a, a, a much smaller capacitor so they can deliver their power much faster although they only have a a tiny little bit of, of energy stored inside them um, but it also filters out a bit of noise from the power rails as well um, i don't really know because uh, as i always say i'm not the expert so i don't really know if they're actually required um, and i don't know if we do actually require one on every chip i always include them on my designs um, so if they are needed they're there and if they're not needed, they don't do any harm. Um, they don't cost much money. You may as well fit them rather than struggling with problems trying to work out what's going on. I personally have never really found any issues without them. Um, but when I was working on the video circuitry the other day, for the first time, I did see the video screen um, was, was missing some pixels. And as soon as I dropped in a bypass capacitor, the pixels appeared, took it out again, pixels disappeared so they obviously do have some impact it's just not always visible to us um so yeah we'd love to hear your thoughts on on how i've arranged the capacitors and if you've got um any other ideas or if you think i'm doing something wrong it would just be great to hear other people's ideas and thoughts um that's about it on the pcb we can have a quick look at the 3d view so it has rendered all the components. Easy Easy A doesn't always have all the, the 3D models, so it can't always render them. Um, you can see that I've decided to use female headers. Um, that's different to what I've done in the past. I've normally used male headers. But the idea here is that it makes it a little bit easier to work with breadboarding. We're still prototyping at this stage. So I want to connect this to a breadboard, and it means I can just use the standard male-to-male jumper wires, standard jump breadboard jumper wires, um, rather than having to use the male to female wires, which I've found to be a little bit unreliable, but they're, they're not too bad. Um, so I, I'm undecided if I'm actually going to fit male or female headers, but um, I could decide that later. It makes no difference to the design of the PCB. Yeah, so I'll get this on order. Um, that's about it for now. Um, and I'll see you in the next one.